So I want to thank uh, Tammy and Sarah for inviting me and for the immense amount of work that went into putting this conference together. And it's just extremely exciting to be here as someone who's participated in a lot of mechanisms meetings over the years. It's really incredible to see this come uh, together in this way and have so many people and such good work being presented. So today I'm going to be talking about novel approaches to assessing motivation in the treatment of problem drinkers. And I'm going to be in, in that way trying to address the, the topic of this talk, which was common uh, processes or common mechanisms and how we might approach them. Um, so, Okay, great, thanks. Okay, so just, just briefly an overview. So I want to talk just uh, for a couple of minutes about a, a programmatic research framework uh, that uh, my colleagues and I have been, uh, have developed uh, to try to address uh, uh, the issues of mechanisms and kind of provides a background and rationale for some of the work that I'm going to be talking about. Then I want to uh, talk about uh, novel approaches and really the question that I want to address is, do novel approaches improve the assessment of motivation to reduce drinking better than our other standard measures? So it's a little bit, uh, apropos of the prior talk, can we do better using these novel approaches? So we're going to look at uh, implicit cognitions uh, uh, trial, uh, an ecological momentary assessment approach, and then we'll compare uh, across standard uh, EMA and, uh, and uh, IC measures. And I won't be showing neuroimaging data today. We do have neuroimaging data, I would have to say, apropos of prior talks. A lot of the early neuroimaging data that we collected, we didn't find to be actually that useful. And so we went back to saying, we need to take a more iterative approach to really figure out what we want to test as a target and then design measures that we think will test that target. And so as most of you know, designing an implicit cognition test that you think is valid and important and target something is, a, is often a pre-step to actually doing the neuroimaging. But I'll, I'll be showing you just some future work on neuroimaging. So, so this is a, a great slide uh, courtesy of Tim Apodaca and Dick Longaba, which just sort of shows the problem space that we have in, in, in mechanisms. So uh, we have a treatment that works and our hypothesis is that the treatment works because there's certain things that the therapist is doing that's influencing patient's behavior and that patient behavior is then uh, impacting substance use outcomes. So if you just take CBT, therapists are uh, teaching coping skills. Uh, that teaching of the coping skill will increase the patient's ability to cope, and the greater ability to cope will re result in reduced substance use outcomes. And what's been surprising, and, and we've wrote, written about this as have many others, it's been very difficult to connect all of these lines together. And although there are cases in which we can do it, those are uh, uh, relatively rare, and as a result, we haven't really been able to demonstrate this, nor extract the knowledge from this to yet to improve treatment. And so that, I think, is really our problem space. Um, today, I want to talk about just one link in this problem space, which is the issue of motivation and getting measures of motivation that actually track treatment and predict outcome. And so this is kind of surprising when you go back and look at the literature. Uh, motivation is certainly something that every treatment is really trying to affect. Uh, motivational interviewing, we've studied it a lot, but every treatment is trying to you know, get people to be more motivated or sustain their motivation to change. And, and we definitely think people who are more motivated are going to have better outcomes. It's been very difficult across the literature to, to establish this relationship. Uh, there's a really great review by Molly McGill and JCCP on change talk and some very counterintuitive findings. So this is kind of strange. It's a problem uh, because if we can't do that, if we can't even get this one, uh, it's going to be hard to, to really to do the rest. So, so broadly speaking, you know, a couple of years ago, courtesy of NIAAA, we had a BAA. We worked with a bunch of people, and we we tried to identify. So what are the challenges that the, in the in the approaches that we've been using. And so we kind of identified a couple that we thought were important. One is the conceptual frameworks that underlie treatment uh, of our, most of our treatments are, are not really grounded in basic, in the modern basic cognitive affective neurosciences. We've learned so much about cognitive affective processes and they don't really inform our models. 
Also, most of the models are not actually addiction specific. We have a great knowledge base on addiction uh, issues and, and, and we're not using that to really tell us how the treatments are working, although they may be working based on addiction specific mechanisms. There's huge diagnostic heterogeneity that people have mentioned. Our, our approaches for subtyping schemes, which are basically descriptive, don't work very well. They're not very good differential predictions of a response, and that's something that's true for other disorders. Uh, another thing is treatment is highly dynamic. We tend to think of it treatment in our models as a linear process. Just so, for example, there ought to be a dose response relationship. The number of sessions of CBT you get ought to predict how well you did, or the number of homework sessions. It doesn't turn out to be the case. And what we know is, is actually treatment's highly dynamic, it's variable, the trajectories are different. We need to be able to account for this. And that, finally, the change process is not well captured by our current measurement or statistic methods. If we measure change, at, at pre and post treatment, and we use you know regression analyses, we're really missing both what's happening as well as how it affects individuals. So we really identified these things, and then we we tried to identify approaches in the literature that were currently not being used in standard clinical trials, and and then we we focused on trying to bring them into our lab with a with a multidisciplinary team effort, and I'll share our team later. I'm not going to go over this too much, but, but just to say, cognitive neuroscience is certainly one, and my colleagues and I, particularly Nasser Nakfi, who's in the audience, um, Nasser, you want to just raise your hand? This was great and really been instrumental in this work. Um, we've also looked, then just trying to ground it in, in science, we've also looked at trying to include genetics uh, to help with the heterogeneity, and Andrew Chen is also in the room here, and Andrew has done some really excellent work looking at serotonin transporter gene and showing that polymorphisms uh, moderate the effect of CBT, uh, and that was really interesting. And then uh, we've also done a lot of work with ecologic momentary assessment and dynamic systems modeling to try to get at both the uh, assessing the dynamic characteristics of treatment and then measuring them in a multidimensional way. And so today, and, and by the way, I don't think if we wouldn't have had the BAA, we ever would have done this, because this is really ambitious, but we were encouraged, I think correctly so, to think out of the box and do a lot, try to do a lot. So today, uh, but the question really is, is, well, does any of this really make a difference? Well, here's the promise, it all should be helpful, does it? And as you can see, there's a lot of, it's hard to get this done. So I want to show you something that I thought was, was quite good. So I want to talk about some findings that I actually think are quite promising, even surprising to me. So, um, so just I want to take common treatment targets, I'm going to call them mechanisms, motivation, coping, craving. I mean, those are things that most treatments really want to you know, affect in some major way. So if we think just about two of these aspects, the cognitive neuroscience and the EMA, essentially cognitive neuroscience would say, well, if you want to measure these constructs, you really have to think about them as multifaceted cognitive affective constructs. They don't just, they're not just one process. Number two, you have to have multi-level assessments. And multi-level assessments could be a number of things, but in our, the way we're thinking about it is explicit, implicit brain imaging. And, and if you, and so the example we give in, Nasser and I give in the article is impulsivity, with, which Mark Potenza knows about. What we, we always had thought impulsivity we can measure with a self-report questionnaire. It turns out there's no single definition of impulsivity. Impulsivity is many different components, and in order to measure that, you need many different tests at different levels. And we're still trying to work that out. We have not actually done this in terms of motivation in a treatment sample. Uh, EMA is another methodology. EMA is, helps us from a dynamic point of view track people, and it actually, there's individual level change over time so that we, we're not looking at groups. And then importantly, it's also assessing in context in real time so we have a more accurate assessment. So here's what we did. We wanted to try to see whether we could develop measures of motivation using implicit cognition and EMA. So our first study was essentially uh, one, you know, and, and this just reviews explicit measures have some problems, craving, they're not the best uh, measures, implicit measures actually might be better. We were looking for a motivational measure and we selected reaction time to approach or avoid alcohol cues. And as most many of you know, there's a really good literature on implicit approach avoidance motivations. Uh, they definitely predict drinking severity. 
uh, in a number of studies. Um, there's a really great work by Renard Weirs and his colleagues on the AAT showing that if you, uh, people who uh, use a task to avoid alcohol actually reduce the drinking, so there seems to be some mechanism there. But as of yet, and there is some, even some brain imaging data on this task. But as of yet, we, this task has not really been looked at in the context of treatment. So what we did is, is we wanted to look at this. We, uh, the, the, the key is reaction to alcohol avoid pictures. I'll talk about this in a minute. So our measurement was trying to uh, adapt the stimulus compatibility response task, which took us some time to our population. And um, what we, the population we used was heavy drinkers. These are really problem drinkers in treatment seeking to moderate their drinking. And we have a baseline to eight week uh, time frame to look at. So here's the task, just very, very briefly. Um, approach is you pull the joystick towards you, and when you pull it towards you, the alcohol picture gets bigger. So that is kind of ecologically valid in terms of I like to get my alcohol. And on the void, the alcohol stimulus goes away. And then we have a, a control stimulus, and then we, we figure out reaction times. So if people are interested in the details, I can provide them. By the way, this was highly stimulating for, for participants, but these are people who are moderating the drinking, not trying to stop drinking. So, um, but so I, we thought it had some, um, okay, let me see if I can go back here. Yeah, so this is just a study timeline. So just to say, we had a baseline when people are coming in, they got this task at baseline, there was an eight week treatment period, they got the task post, and then we had a four week follow up. And this is a small subsample. We're, 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 this is part of a larger study we're currently conducting, but we have the first 60 subjects. I'm not gonna talk about the differences in treatment conditions they were controlled for, so they're not particularly relevant at this, for this. So do approach and avoidance uh, change over time? Uh, actually, the answer is yes, but not approach from pre to end of treatment See, is reduced, but that's not a significant difference, and it's mostly because there's a lot of variability in this measure. In a larger sample, it probably would be. This is kind of complex. I don't have time to get into sort of that particular part of it. Let me just move on to, well, do baseline approach and avoidance predict post-treatment drinking? Uh, and the answer is yes, this is for some standard drinks. And you can see that's approach, that's avoidance. This is no drinking days, approach, avoidance. This is drinks per drinking day, that's approach, avoidance. And so what you can see is, this is our primary measure, but you can see there is a very consistent response across three different measures of drinking, which is, uh, um, which is, which is encouraging because sometimes we get one and not the other, and then you sort of wonder what you've gotten. One of the just curious things here is, Although approach does, although avoidance doesn't predict, it actually predicts here, and this is unique variant. So it looks like your decision whether to drink on a given day has some unique aspect of both how fast you uh, approach alcohol or how slow you approach alcohol and how fast you push it away, suggesting that they, these may be somewhat different uh, pieces of information or different aspects of motivation. That may be the case. Okay. So, well, does, the question is, does that explain any unique variance in drinking outcomes? So here's uh, the month after treatment, here's baseline drinking, which predicts a significant amount of the, the variance and change, uh, and here's the approach avoidance score, uh, and as you can see, it predicts an additional 12% of the variance. If you look at this, this is a, accounted for in the model uniquely by approach. And the alpha for approach is about three quarters of the size of baseline drinking. So by all measures, that's pretty good as a predictor given the fact that you're essentially doing a 10 minute task uh, at the beginning of treatment. So then we wanted to say, well, does that actually do better than a traditional measure? So readiness to change is, is often the measure that we use to assess motivation. And, and here the readiness to change measure did not, was not a significant predictor. But even when you enter readiness to change and then you enter uh, the approach avoidance, you, you, be, you get the same prediction. So essentially demonstrating that this measure does better than a standard measure. So what was implicit, what were these implicit motivations related to? So we thought they'd sort of be related to change, to action, but they weren't. 
Um, they were related to drink appraisal measures. So I'm just going to put this up here and just explain. So, so this measure, Pam, was asking people uh, to talk up to, to checklist the benefits they think they would get short term in the next three months if they reduce their drinking. So you see people who had lower, slower approach endorsed more benefit. Similarly, if you just look at this one, just it's the same thing. People who had higher avoidance endorsed more negative, more, more, more benefit. So you see that people are appraising alcohol in a certain sense on a conscious level, those are what relates to the push-pull test, which was surprising to us, and it was not related to severity of drinking, which you'd think in, in other, and I could talk about sort of thoughts about that. Um, the, the correlations here are about 0.3, which if people know about explicit implicit measures, that's about what you typically find when you look across these dimensions. Okay, so then we have, then we, we went to EMA, and we said, well, we'd like to actually use EMA to study these common treatment targets. Um, Here's our method. We used fixed morning and evening collected data using an iPhone-enabled script for people in treatment. This is twice a day. The population is the same, heavy drinkers in treatment. There were two constructs we looked at among many, but this is the two I'm going to talk about. The motivation was how committed are you not to drink heavily over the next 24 hours? So you're asked that in the morning, and then we collect your drinking data for that day, for the next 24 hours, confidence is self-efficacy. And here's the basic analysis that we're looking at, which is uh, you know, today's drinking, controlling for uh, yesterday's drinking, baseline drinking, and essentially what we're trying to look at is the individual level effects of commitment or confidence yesterday. And so um, this is essentially the model predicting daily drinking. And as you can see, and this is the simplified model, this just has the predictors in it. So today's drinking is, even after controlling for drinking at baseline and drinking yesterday, yesterday's commitment is significantly related to today's drinking. So from a causal point of view, that's pretty impressive in the sense that you've controlled for a lot of different things, and this is not just at a group level, it's an individual level. And as you can see from this, this is the relationship where people in low in commitment are on average drinking about eight standard drinks a day. People who are high in commitment are actually drinking more like two or three drinks a day. And so that's meaningful clinically. Um, okay, so the next question we asked ourselves is, okay, well, if we have these two different measures of motivation, they ought to actually be related. But they're not, um, <laughs> which is surprised to us. Um, so approach avoidance are not related. By the way, this is at a trend level, but it's in, it's in the opposite of the predicted direction. So it doesn't look like your approach avoidance predicts anything about your commitment. And it didn't predict anything about self-efficacy. So what are these things picking up on? And I think that's a critical question. So the, and then the final one that we asked was, OK, um, if we looked at these uh, things together, of approach avoidance and EMA commitment. So here's what we did. We took the approach avoidance scores and we just took the first week of EMA. That was the period right before you got the approach avoidance and we just did a sum score for that. So what you find is um, here's what you have. It's that same measure of uh, drinks. Here's uh, week one drinking. And here's the other two in the equation. You can see that each is significantly predicting drinking outcome, explaining around 5% of the variance. So each one of these things apparently contributes a unique aspect to predict, predict, predicting drinking. So that was really encouraging. So what's the take home from this? So I, I want to say this is exploratory. The analyses, we ran them very rigorously. We've done a lot of work on this, but it's a subsample. I think what you'd have to say is, is these novel approaches actually are uh, promising in terms of they're really informing us about something about motivation in terms of prediction that we really didn't, that we really haven't seen before. Certainly in our data, and I think in the field in general, we're missing measures that we think are really critical markers of motivation as they evolve over time and relate to outcome. And this potentially could be a way to track people's motivation and get to issues like non-response, differential treatment response, so on and so forth. Um, the findings suggest what, we, what, what, the, what the framework had sort of uh, hypothesized, 
then maybe motivation to reduce drinking is actually a multi-dimensional, multi-level construct. There might be avoidance and approach motivations were predictors. They were separate from EMA commitment not to drink heavily. And each was a unique predictor of drinking outcome. And even in this, it looked like approach and avoidance motivations might actually have separate components to them. So that was interesting. <clears throat> and it may be, and I think part of the work here is then trying to walk back and think about the basic social affective processes that these things might be related to. And they're slightly different than the ones that are out there about approach avoid that Reynolds Weirs has talked about in terms of action tendencies. This is speculation at this point. But it might be actually that the cue salience uh, uh, value or valuation of a cue when you're in treatment actually is quite different and independent from what your goal-directed behavior might be. You, and for, for example, you might feel alcohol is not a particularly good thing, but, but for a variety of reasons, you're not ready to commit to change. Uh, or, or conversely, you might feel uh, like I'm really ready to change, but alcohol is extremely uh, uh, enticing. So these are things we need to figure out more. And obviously, as we get neuroimaging into the picture, we're going to be able to even parse the cognitive processes of these further and try to understand their component parts. So I'm just going to end by just saying that we are working on fMRI. This is a study that's being done by Laura Martin uh, on just on the, not in this task, but regulation of craving tasks. And that has some promising uh, results associated with it. And hopefully, uh, when we get this study done in future years, we'll be coming back and saying something good about this too. And so I, I want to end by just acknowledging great collaborators. Um, uh, Kevin Oxner, Peter Goldwitzer, and Gabe Rodgen are senior uh, cognitive science and cognitive neuroscience not doing alcohol work. They came on board because of the BAA, and it's been phenomenally helpful to have them, although difficult to, to manage all of that. And I want to, yeah, and I want to thank Alexis Corvus, Laura Martin, and Nasser Nakfi, and Alexis in the audience too for for doing great work. <laughs>